Welcome back. Our final uh, presenter today is uh, uh, Dr. Tris Stadnik. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil Engineering in the Faculty of Engineering, uh, right in this building. Uh, she is uh, currently the principal researcher on a river isotope study to discern the sources of runoff generation for the Mackenzie River and its main tributaries. She is also leading a study of climate change impacts on stream flow generation in the Winnipeg River Basin. Generally, when we think of water, it's usually because we are filling a glass, turning on the shower, or going for a swim. It's easy to lose sight of the big picture. Water is the lifeblood of our planet, and there is a world water crisis looming. Dr. Stadnik is here to tell us what the University of Manitoba researchers are doing to address the future water supply and sustainability issues. She will also explain how Canada is affected by the water crisis and how you and I can make a real difference. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Statnik. As Dr. J.S. introduced me. Uh, my name is Trish Stadnik, and I'm a professor here in this very building in civil engineering, right up on the third floor there. Um, I have to say, I am really impressed by the sheer numbers here. It's pretty cool to see how many people came out and are taking an interest in what's going on at the university level and all the research and stuff like that. I have to admit I'm a tad bit jealous too, because when I was in your shoes, which, I mean, let's face it, it wasn't quite as long ago as some of my colleagues, um, I had to say that. <laughs> it's the only advantage I have. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my future. So my job here today is to talk to you about water. I think, because I'm a self-proclaimed water geek, that it's probably the most important topic out there. And hopefully by the end of the day, at least some of you guys will agree with me. But let me just point out that if you're not immediately interested in water, 70% of what you're made up of is actually water. So you kind of have to care about it at least a little. I'm going to begin with where I began, kind of a pivotal turning point for me in my career in water. Um, I actually am fairly new here. I came about a year and a half ago from the University of Waterloo, so I'm relatively new to, to Manitoba. I came to Manitoba because of the water here, because it's a water-based province. It is a wonderful province if you're studying water. I actually started out in environmental engineering, and I thought not too long ago when I was sitting in your shoes, that I wanted to be an environmental engineer and save the world in terms of water quality. Well, an experience that I had in fourth year university on my undergrad thesis actually changed my mind and changed the whole course of my future. This is the Juta Valley in Chile, South America. It's in the middle of the Atacama Desert, which is the driest desert in this world. It rains about once every 10,000 years and it actually rained when I was visiting, which was really cool. I went here for my fourth year thesis project. And we went here to actually look at water um, quality issues in the river, this green patch right in the middle of these desert mountains that you see, that services the village. This river, most times, nice quiet little babbling brook that winds its way down these mountains. But every once in a while, that little river decides to become a raging torrent. This is actually a picture of when I was there. This is me and some of my colleagues on this project. We're standing in the middle of the main highway or at least what was the main highway. And this is the main road into and out of Molinos, Chile, the little village that we went to to try to solve their water quality issues. Why do they have water quality issues? Because when this happened, this particular flood, it not only wiped out their entire sustenance, their farmlands, but it also wiped out their water treatment system because it was near the river, nice and easily accessible so they could get clean water. The problem was it forever changed the way that these people live. Okay? The problem was not the water quality, even though that was the end result. The problem was controlling the water in the valley and understanding where the water comes from and how much water there actually is in this particular region. For three months, they had to wait for water to even be trucked in. So for three months, they were using the raw river water in this actual valley, which was laced with arsenic, boron, and a whole host of other metals from upstream in the Bolivian mountain ranges. That's when I decided that I actually wanted to look at the water quantity issue, because unless we get water quantity right, 
we don't have a hope in anything of solving the water quality issues. But don't take my word for it. I'm going to start this presentation with an introduction far better than I can do. Um, this movie is actually put out by Sam Bozo is his last name, believe it or not. It's called Blue Gold, World Water Wars. And I'm actually going to play the first part of this movie just to give you a nice little introduction to what's going on in the world right now with water. It's about six minutes or so. In 1906, Pablo Valencia dared the journey from Mexico to California in search of gold. He survived without water for a week, seven days. He was rescued and documented the experience of thirst. Saliva becomes thick. A lump seems to form in the throat. The tongue swells so large that it squeezes past the jaws. The throat so swollen that breathing becomes difficult, creating a terrifying sense of drowning. The face feels full due to the shrinking of the skin. Many people begin to hallucinate. The eyelids crack and the eyeballs begin to weep tears of blood. When Pablo Valencia was found, his skin was like purplish gray leather, scratched but with no traces of blood. His lips had disappeared as if amputated. His nose withered to half its length. His eyes trapped in a winkless stare. This is not a film about saving the environment. It's a film about saving ourselves. Because whatever one's environmental, political, or religious opinions, whatever one's race, sex, or economic standing, whomever of us goes without water for a week, cries blood. There is always a lot of focus on, well, what's the environmental impact? And that's a perfectly valid issue and concern. The abuse of water and the taking of excess of water, diminishing flows and levels, can destroy the sustainability of ecosystems. But we can't, in the name of preventing environmental impacts, there's a mentality that says, well, as long as we're not causing any significant impacts, we should be able to use the water any way we want, including selling it, exporting it for private gain of a few. When, you, when it's all said and done, people need water to survive. That's what, that's what the bottom line is. When we search the universe for life, we search for water. Because it is only from liquid water that all known forms of life exist. The blue planet, the only planet known to harbor life, the only planet known to be flowing with water. Water management has always been of key importance to humans. The Egyptians depended entirely upon the Nile. The Romans expanded the boundaries of engineering to use gravity to bring water to their cities. Ancient societies cherished water, molded their lives around it, and even worshipped it as a god. For whatever reason, between 800 and 1000 AD, climate change dried up most of the Mayans' local water supply. 
farmers were forced to extend their agriculture into the jungle forests to grow food. There was not enough water for both the crops and trees, so the forests died. The soil eroded, air humidity decreased, food decreased. Mayan leaders prayed to the god of rain, but the regular rain season brought little water. The hydrologic cycle was damaged. Life in the cities became less civilized as the main focus of Mayan life became providing food and water. People abandoned the cities to begin a new life in the forests in hopes that there was still a sustainable watershed there. There wasn't. But as we enter a new era combining high technology with the demands of global economic trade, we're entering into a unique stage of history. Water, which is the source of life itself, instead of being common and universal to everybody because we all depend on it, profit is made out of the running of and the delivery of water to people and to, to communities. Those that have the ability to pay will have access to the water. Those who do not have the ability to pay will go without. And therefore, it's a life and death situation in the final analysis on the basis of profit. All right, so that's where I'm going to end it, if I can get back to the presentation. There we go. Okay. So that video, at least the introduction part of the video, is pretty much describing what I'm going to go through today in terms of the talk. I'm going to start by picking up where the Mayan civilization part left out. It's a little section that I like to call creating turbulence, obviously a water analogy. I'm going to talk to you about more examples of the same kinds of situations, both in the past and in the present, as well as much closer to home than you might expect in terms of water issues that affect us all and the things that we do have to think about, my generation and your generation. The next part of the talk that I'm going to enter into today will talk about this blue planet. It will talk about global water issues, the distribution of water here in Canada, or in the world, and also how water is distributed here in Canada and how those issues affect us. Again, probably a little closer to home than some of you might think. And the last part of the talk, I'm going to talk about how I see the future, which is that it's not green, I wear blue goggles instead, that the future is actually blue. So I'm going to talk about some of my research that I do to tackle the water crisis, and also the future of the field as a whole, which is actually looking for extraterrestrial sources of water. So creating turbulence. We already um, heard a little bit about the Mayan example, but I'm going to recap that and give you guys a chance to answer a question or two for me. And then I'm going to talk about the Nile River, which was briefly mentioned in the video, as well as the Colorado River and the Little Saskatchewan River, which actually runs straight through the heart of Manitoba and exits into Hudson Bay. In terms of the Mayan civilization, what can we learn from that? Well, at the peak of the civilization, there was about 2,000 people per square mile. And I don't know about you, but that didn't mean much to me at first. Let me put it into context for you. Way back when, that was equivalent to Los Angeles County today, Los Angeles, California. Okay, so that's a pretty dense population for a really ancient civilization. There was, for six centuries, this civilization, civilization thrived, and then all of a sudden, anthropologically, one day in history, it died off. The reason why, anybody know? Water. Okay, but what about the water? We, as humans, not us obviously in this room, destroyed the hydrologic cycle. I don't know if any of you were aware that we as humans can actually have a direct impact on how water cycles, but here's what happened. They cultivated the land to basically clear it for agriculture to grow food for this thriving population. Not unlike what we're doing today in our own society. They have to grow crops to feed the people. When they grow the crops, they have to cut down the trees. By cutting down the trees, you make space for the crops. But when you cut down the trees, you make the soil more vulnerable to wind and water, so that every time it rains, the soil runs off the land along with the water. Well, what happens, what's in that soil? All the fertilizer that the crops need to grow. So then the crops don't thrive as much, they start to struggle, they die off, along with the fact that you no longer have trees shading the ground, all of the water that was in that soil now starts to evaporate and the temperatures start to increase of the soil. When the evaporation finally stops because you don't have any more water left, 
then you no longer have moisture in the air. When you no longer have moisture in the air, you can't create rain. And by the way, for the record, rain dances actually do work. Just a little tidbit of information. You can ask me why afterwards if you don't know. But if you don't have the moisture particles in the air, it's not going to fall on the ground. And when it doesn't fall on the ground, you not only lose the crops and the food that the people need, but you then lose the water supply, which means that people have only two choices, either stay and die or pick up and move, which is ultimately what happened to the Mayans. And oddly, the same thing we're doing these days. The Nile River Basin. Here's a picture of the basin. It's one of, it is the longest river in the world, and it's one of the largest river basins in the world. The river starts up here in a really large lake and moves downstream that way. So it actually goes from south to north. It's in the center of Africa, one of the driest continents on Earth, and there's 10 countries that are actually housed within the basin. Aside from two, Kenya and Egypt, those are the poorest countries in the world. The river itself sustains three million people, okay? The population of Canada is like 33 million at most. So the three million people rely on the water here in the Nile River. However, the river is controlled by two of those countries, Egypt and Sudan. Oddly, right at the mouth of the river or where the river enters the lake. Why is that important? Well, because if they control who can use the water and they're right at the end of the river, they're basically saying no to everyone upstream. All of these people living in these areas cannot use a drop of that water without getting permission or an agreement from Egypt and Sudan. Sound fair? Not so much. And this is a quote from the former Egyptian president, that the only matter that can take Egypt to war again is over water. A little bit scary. Colorado River Basin, same similar situation. You've got a fairly large basin. In this case, it's surrounded by quite a few states. We've got California, Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, Colorado, and New Mexico. The Colorado River um, is also the home of the Hoover Dam. The Hoover Dam construction um, was completed in 1936, and the US federal government formed a special commission in and about 1922 that actually brought together all these states surrounding the Colorado River, so all those states that I just named, to actually figure out how to use the water that's stored by this brand new huge state-of-the-art dam and how to actually preserve what flow was left in the Colorado River on the downstream side of the dam to make sure that it was fair for everybody. So they're trying to learn from the example of the Nile River. The problem? Anybody want to take a guess? That's right. I didn't name off Mexico. I said New Mexico. We've got this guy down here. This river drains from here down this way, goes through Mexico and into the ocean. The river no longer reaches Mexico on any given day. No joke, the Colorado River does not actually meet the ocean most times anymore. You guys may have heard of the water crisis in Mexico, the fact that they're over pumping their groundwater and the whole city is sinking. Has anybody heard about that? Why are they over pumping the groundwater? They don't have any surface water left, so what choice do they have? We force ourselves into a corner with the environmental consequences that we put forth by making decisions and acting on them without knowing the consequences. How about an example a little bit closer to home in case you're not scared enough yet? The North Saskatchewan River. This is a, a newspaper article that was actually in the newspaper almost a year ago, April 4th, 2009, turning gold into lead. Today, it is still one of the most pristine, glacially-fed rivers in the world, and it's right here in Canada. It originates at the Columbia Ice Fields in um, the headwaters of Alberta, so in the nice, big, rocky mountain ranges. Some of you may have even been to the Columbia Ice Fields. I have. It's absolutely impressive. It's a glacier. That's where this little river begins. It flows all the way down from there through Saskatchewan, through Banff National Park first, then through Saskatchewan, and then into Lake Winnipegosis, which is the north end of Lake Manitoba for most intensive purposes. How many people have a cottage on Lake Manitoba? Raise your hand. Okay, a couple of you. Even if you have a cottage on Lake Winnipeg, the same 
theory applies. All rivers that originate in the mountain ranges and drain through Manitoba affect the water supply here. This little river, well, let me read you some of the article because that will best illustrate it. You can't read it here, but I'm going to read it to you. Three barrels of water are required to produce one barrel of tar sands oil. Thus, every barrel of tar sands oil exported represents three barrels of virtual water, which means that for every barrel of oil, we're taking away part of our water that we can never get back. Climate change and the industry's insatiable thirst are on a collision course, and the situation is recklessly unsustainable. The industry's toxic tailings ponds, which is where they put all the extra stuff that's not oil that they don't want to use, um, is a disaster in the waiting. The largest tailing pond belonging to Sin Crude, which is an oil company, was the biggest dam on earth until China's Three Gorges Dam was built. The biggest dam on earth was a tailings pond. Just think about that for a second. Three Gorges Dam is much bigger than the Hoover Dam, by the way. The tailings pond hold a stew of some of the most toxic elements on earth. If any of these ponds were to ever breach and discharge into the river, the world would forever forget about the Exxon Valdez. How many people have heard of the Exxon Valdez? Okay, more than I thought, actually. The pollution would flow down the Mackenzie River into the Beaufort Sea and beyond into the Arctic Ocean, which is a global ocean. The Exxon Valdez, just to give you some context for those who haven't heard about it, released about 11 million gallons of crude oil into Alaska's Prince William Sound in 1989. They are still finding oil today in the gravel beds on the beaches of that sound. The polyaromatic hydrocarbons, the bad part of the oil, alone in the tar ponds represent 3,000 Exxon Valdez incidents. 3,000. That's what's housed in the tailings ponds that are upstream of Lake Manitoba. What happens upstream affects us right here. Okay, so the dilemma, now that I've scared you all. We have to know how much water there is. It's not just a pollution problem, it's knowing how much water there is because we need to know how much we can safely use, whether it's for industry or whether it's for drinking. They're not competing resources. We have to figure that part out. We have to know where the water's coming from, so where it's, how much has been there in the past, how much is there today, and how much there's going to be in the future, which I'll talk about when I talk about my research specifically. We also need to know how much we can sustainably use and the impact of any usage that we choose to, to actually implement. So before I launch into the research part, I want to give you some context about where water actually is and what we know about it. I'm first going to talk about where all the water has gone in the first place, so the distribution of it, how much we have here in Canada, and um, basically what we need to do to protect that. Most of you have probably seen the statistics. 71% of the Earth in the Earth's surface, that beautiful picture that represents some of my background slides, 71% of Earth's surface is covered by water. About 98% of that, a little bit more, it's like 98.6, is actually surface water, so it's available on the surface. However, 97%, plus or minus, is actually salt water, saline. We can't drink it without really expensive technology to remove the salt from it. About 2.8%, therefore, is fresh water, so we can drink that. The problem is that out of that 2.8%, 2.15% is actually almost permanently locked in ice caps and ice sheets, which means that we can't actually drink that. So I don't know about you and your math skills, but when I look at that, that's not a very good percentage of the world's water that we actually have access to. And here in Canada, at least, that's pretty shocking to me because we shower for 20, 30 minutes and don't even think about that. Well, it's not a lot of water to go around. Just to put it into perspective, the piece of the pie that we can actually use is that little tiny green slice right there. That's the amount that we have available on the surface. About 1.6% is in the ground, so we oftentimes pump groundwater as well. Again, still not a huge percentage that we're talking about here. And a very, very, very small percentage is actually in the air as vapor. But don't be misled. That percentage is very small because look at what happened, or is very important. Look what happened to the Mayan civilization. You take that percentage away and you don't have any rain, which therefore means you don't replenish the groundwater. So it's a whole cycle. 
Here's a map of population density around the world. Probably not a big surprise to you guys. Most people, we're the crazy ones, are in the warm regions near the equator. Central, central uh, center of the globe, Central Asia, Central Europe, that kind of stuff. That's where they want to live. They don't want snow and ice. Small populations in the north ends, that kind of stuff. There's the map of water scarcity. Not surprising. The areas that we have the highest populations also represent the areas that have the least amount of water available to them, the red zones. The areas with the lowest populations, like here in Canada, are the areas where we have more water than we know what to do with, for the most part. The distribution is not fair. Approximately 1 billion out of the 6.1 billion people on this earth live in water scarcity. Okay? By 2030, more than 50% of us will live in water scarcity. That's within your lifetime. Okay, how about here? 7% of the world's fresh water resides right here in Canada, in this beautiful country of ours where we have tons of water, tons of pristine wilderness, right? We are the fourth richest nation in water per capita. We have about, give or take, 0.5% of the world's population, but 7% of the fresh water, more than our fair share. We also have, this is probably a lesser known fact, 25% or one quarter of the world's wetlands. Why is that significant? Because the wetlands represent where we store water. It's also nature's purification system. So nature actually cleans the water so that we can use it for drinking and other supplies and other uses. That is really, really good for us. We can make a huge difference there because more than 50% of the world's wetlands have actually disappeared since 1900. 50% are now gone. Nature's storage and filtration mechanism. That's awesome, right? How about that? 80% of the wetlands here in Canada have already been destroyed, and right here in Manitoba, 71% are now gone from what was here in the early 1900s. Why? Because we've cleared the land for agriculture. Sound familiar? I don't know about you, but I'm thinking the Mayans. 70% are used for agriculture. Now, there's another point that I want to bring up here. How many people love eating fruits and vegetables, especially after the last presentation, in the wintertime? Grapes, apples, cherries, raspberries. I had raspberries on my oatmeal this morning. We grow them here? No, not so much. It's a little cold here. I can say that, having been a new import to this province. The problem is that we are buying fruit, we are buying coffee, we are buying vegetables from some of the poorest regions in the world. Well, what does it take to grow fruits and vegetables? Water. Water from physically water-scarce regions. We are buying them. When we grow agriculture here, when we grow crops, 70% of our land, our wetlands, have been destroyed. We export those crops to other nations. We're exporting pieces of our watersheds that we can never get back. You know, it's, we've got to have a shift in the way that we think about water and the way that we think about our water resources. It's not just the bottled water that we drink. It's not just the tap water. It's also the fruits and the vegetables because tomatoes, 70% water. Okay, so let's test some of your trivia here with water. I do this with uh, my fourth year class. And I have to tell you, they didn't score very well, so we'll see how you guys do. I'm hoping for better results. We're going to raise our hands, true or false, in A, B, C, and D. First one, true or false, you could stand two Empire State buildings on top of each other, and they would, e they would equal the depth of the deepest lake in the world. How many people think that's true? Raise your hand. How many people think that's false? Raise your hand. Woohoo! you guys got that one. It's actually four. It's not two, it's four. What percentage of people living in Manitoba rely on surface water for drinking water? How many people think A? Raise your hand. Okay. How many people think B? Got a few takers. How about C? That's not good. It would help if you could actually see it. How about C? 67%. Okay, and how about D? D has it, and you guys are? 
Correct. Nearly all of us rely on surface water as our main source of sustenance in terms of drinking water. True or false? Under a two-mile layer thick, um, two-mile thick layer of ice at the South Pole, there is an unfrozen lake the size of Lake Ontario. Unfrozen so, lake the size of Lake Ontario. True. Raise your hand. False. Drum roll, please. True. Unfrozen. It's pretty cool. I didn't know that either, for the record, until I actually did the research. True or false? Canadian rivers contribute water contribute to water uh, water to two separate oceans. True. False. How many? Three. Or. It's three oceans, yes, but it's commonly referred to as four because parts, the southern part of Alberta and Saskatchewan actually drain all the way south into the Mississippi River system and all the way down through the Gulf of Mexico. But I agree, the Gulf of Mexico is not an ocean. It drains into the Atlantic Ocean. All right, next one. True or false, all waters in Manitoba contribute to the Arctic Ocean. All water. True. Raise your hand. Okay, a few. Look around, see, keep your hands up for a sec. False. The answer is true. All water in Manitoba drains into Hudson Bay and into the Arctic Ocean. Some of you might have been thinking of Lake of the Woods. That's not technically in Manitoba. <laughs> the headwaters are in Ontario. True or false, the Arctic Ocean may be ice free throughout the winter, I didn't even add that on, but ice-free throughout the winter, as soon as 2030. Raise your hand if you think that's true. Raise your hand if you think that's false. Okay, both people kind of have this, but the answer is actually false, because the new models are predicting that it might be ice-free by 2013. Reality check, people, this is 2010. By 2013, we might have no ice in the Arctic. So, I know it's pretty surprising. Just to drive this point home a little bit further, here's the population density map of Canada. Not surprising, the majority of our population is actually centered around the Canada-US border. Here's a map of our relative usage in Canada, or should I say our relative overuse. The red areas represent regions of Canada that are overusing the amount of water that they have in the province. We're a water-rich province, right? Well, we're the last part of that little red tip right there. The reason being, mostly agriculture. We are overusing the amount of resources we have in the south of Winnipeg. Our population is too high, we don't have enough water to sustain, Eventually, not too long from now, we will have a water shortage here. I really like this quote. This is one of my favorite quotes because it's a different way of looking at the problem that hopefully you guys latch on to. Water is a truly unifying element. We all need it, we all want it, and more than anything else in the world, it is the one thing that connects us all. And I truly believe that that is the future of the research field, and is the future of water resources, because we have to look at it differently. It's not something to fight over, it's something to equalize and share. So on that note, I'm going to talk about some of my research, um, and some of the future research that's going to be done in this field. So, yes, we know we have a problem, but what are we doing about it? That's the most important thing. We want to look at where the water comes from, where it ends up going, and ultimately how much we're going to have in the future. Because as we've just seen, we can't necessarily take for granted that we're going to have this amount of water in the future. In fact, I can tell you right now that we won't. The next step is actually looking for different sources of water. And not alternative sources, but actually extraterrestrial sources is the future of this particular field. Water in Canada, we've already talked a lot about it. There are five major river basins, only five, that drain this entire country the largest of the large river basins around the world. They are remote and largely unpopulated. I showed you the population map of Canada. If they're draining the entire continent, then obviously they're fairly unpopulated because our population is only centered around the south. They are also very complex environments, which means that the question, where is the water coming from, isn't as duh as you think it might be. It's not a simple answer. 
The areas that we have, wetlands, very complicated structures in terms of how they store and release water. Frozen soil and snow melt. We all know that when the snow melts, we tend to get flooding. We actually tend to have yearly cycles of flooding here in Canada, which is more than a lot of areas, and it's usually caused by the snow and the snow melt, particularly here in this province. We also have very extreme climates. And when I say extreme, most countries around the world don't have the climate variability that we do, from the very, very cold to the very, very hot. And it changes the whole way that the hydrologic cycle works because of the evaporation component. We don't evaporate when it's freezing cold. We evaporate massive amounts of water when it's really hot. So the first step, identify all the components of the water cycle in a given area. What parts of the area what sources of water in the water hydrologic cycle are actually contributing water to a stream. The second step is actually determine how much there is for each different component of the water cycle. And then the third step is to actually try to predict changes. So we'll actually play with things. That's the engineering part in me. I'll actually set up a model and then I'll say, okay, what if this happens? What if I shut off the rain for a month? What's the effect on the flow? Where does the water go? Where does it come from? How does that change if I change things? Believe it or not, we do all of this by looking at water's DNA. So this is where it gets a little fun. Did you know that water had DNA? It's not actual DNA, but my little experiment here, it's not really a big experiment, but I'm gonna show you what I mean by it. Water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Basic fundamental principles. How many people here have seen a per periodic table? Okay, good. Periodic table. Hydrogen, mass of one, atomic mass. Oxygen, atomic mass of? Thank you. You guys are way better than my fourth year class for the record. <laughs> okay, so H1, O16. We put it together, you have two hydrogens, you have an oxygen. Therefore, water has a mass. It has a normal mass. But, just like everything, you can have the same element, so hydrogen and oxygen, but they can have different masses. Not a foreign concept for you guys. Isotopes, okay? We've probably seen them or introduced them at your stage in terms of radioactive isotopes, so the hydrogen bomb, tritium, H3. We can also have stable isotopes. Hydrogen can also have a mass of two, and oxygen can also have a mass of 17 and 18. So H1, H2, O16, O17, O18. Put all of those combinations together and you can have 17 different combinations of the water molecule, which means 17 different masses. So when I take a little sample of different sources of water, the same size, and I weigh them with a high, highly sensitive machine, I can actually sense the different masses of this one little sample of water. And that is water's DNA. We talk about it in terms of a ratio of heavy to light. So heavy to light oxygen or heavy to light hydrogen. Or put them all together, heavy or light samples of water. So how does it work? Here are my little pseudo lakes, just like up there. I have one container right here that's had a lid on it this entire time that I've been talking. Okay, so presumably no evaporation has occurred. I'm going to assume this is airtight. This one here has been open the entire time I'm talking. My mom always said I was full of hot air, so I've been blowing a steady stream of hot air over this pool of water here, okay? So presumably I've increased the evaporation rate, and the whole time that I've been sitting here, this water has been evaporating. Well, if you were a little sample of water, a little water molecule, would you find it easier to jump out of this pool of water if you were lighter or if you were heavier? Lighter. So that means that whatever water molecules that are in here that escape are the lighter ones, the lighter combinations of mass. The ones that stay in the pool are the heavier ones. They sink to the bottom. Which means that over time, this water, equal volume, will actually be heavier than this one with the lid that hasn't been evaporating because the lighter ones are still in there. So how does that work in the environment? Well, here's a, one of my experiments that I did in the actual field. This is in the Northwest Territories. It's a river system that I looked at. Several different kinds of water. We sampled rain, we sampled snow, and we sampled surface water. So 
my little lake experiment here is the surface water, okay? When I plot the changes in mass in the hydrogen and the changes in mass in the oxygen against each other, you start to see patterns emerging. And those patterns are exactly what you've seen here with the different dots. So the white dots, these ones here are the snow, they're much heavier. I won't get into the technical reasons why, but they have more heavy isotopes. The rain, which has fallen but hasn't had a chance to evaporate, still has the light isotopes mixed in, so overall the samples of the rainwater are a lot lighter. The open surface water samples, just like this one, the lighter isotopes have escaped, so they become heavier than the rain samples, and they have a different pattern to them. When we make a framework like this for a particular region, and then I come along, and this is literally the bottle we use, it's a little 30 millimeter, milliliter sample, I sample the river water, I analyze its mass, and I plot the point up there, I can actually tell, without you telling me, where this was taken, and what source of water, whether it was snow, rain, or lake water, this came from. And that's how we use water's DNA. I can also tell, like you can see up here, differences between different years. Why? Our moisture, our climate, doesn't always come from the same source. Sometimes it's the Pacific Ocean, sometimes it's the Gulf of Mexico, and sometimes it's the Arctic Ocean. And depending on where the waters come from, they each have their own DNA. So we can actually look at and understand how the water cycle works. We can create a model of that and how all these different components work. Then we can change things and get to play with them. We can change temperature, we can change precipitation, and we can pre-predict what's going to happen to the flow by using that model. The result is that we get these plots that show the changes in flow. If the mo in the future, this is for 2020, if everything was exactly the same as it is today, we would have no variation about zero. Everything would be the same. The red line there represents a maximum the, on the top, and on the bottom represents a minimum. And this is actually from a real simulation that I did on the Winnipeg River Basin. As I go forward to the 2050s and the 2080s, we can see that for different lines, different temperatures and precipitations, my flows are actually changing. The overall result from 2020, 2050 to 2080, what's happening to the flow? It's decreasing. So for this particular region, the models are predicting decreases in flows. And that's how we can piece together what's happening in the future. All right, so onwards and upwards to new frontiers. Water on Mars. NASA has been for a while now, it was 2004 that they released these major announcements. They've been looking for water on the Martian planet. The reason why they've chosen Mars is because they think it's the most similar to Earth. The biggest reason for assuming that is that the length of the Martian day is approximately equal to the length of the day on Earth. They think it's relatively the same, therefore. And that kind of makes sense because our proximity to the sun in Earth and Mars is the closest out of all the planets in the solar system. So what are they doing? Well, they have a Spirit rover and an Opportunity rover, two rovers that they launched in 2004. Opportunity is still roaming, or roving. Spirit has actually gone into the last phase of its lifespan, which is that it's actually become now a laboratory platform. And they are actually taking soil samples and soil cores, and what are they analyzing for? Isotopes. They are looking for the presence of the oxygen and hydrogen isotopes to actually see if there is proof of life, proof of water. They're trying to detect water. Their main mission is to test the soil for fossils, to look for picture evidence of fossils, and to test the samples for water. This is actually a video right off of NASA's website that shows Spirit's last moves right before it stopped for the winter facing the sun so the solar panels could collect enough energy to take these samples.
And those were the last pictures transmitted directly from the Martian planet. In the same way that they're transmitting these videos and pictures, they're transmitting the data from the samples they're collecting. So within a few months, we should actually have some answers as to whether there may be water or may have been water on the Martian planet. Similarly, they're also exploring the moon. I don't know if any of you heard about this news release, but in November 2009, just this past November, they crashed a rocket into the moon on purpose. The reason why they did that they were looking to kick up Martian dust, or moon dust, sorry, and analyze that dust for the presence of water using a whole bunch of special cameras that were fired at the crash site. The final verdict is that they're still analyzing the data, but there were anomalies in the wavelength of the light that came back, so they are hopeful that there might be water on the moon. They're not suggesting there's life on the moon, they're actually looking to see if there is water there that we might be able to use for space exploration, so it's already a contained amount of water there that's been deposited by comets. But the good news is, if they find water, where did the water come from? Somewhere else in the solar system. So some final thoughts. My hope is that we can learn from what history tells us. I started off by showing four examples of ways that we've misused and abused our water resources. Let's learn from those past mistakes and not make the same mistakes again. These are issues that do affect you. They affect my generation, they affect your generation. What happens upstream has downstream consequences that you are going to feel, so you should make it your business to get involved in this kind of problem and to have some sort of global awareness that even when you buy a fruit or vegetable from the store, you are changing the water cycle. So now is the time to act before it's too late. We don't want to have what happened to the Mayans happen here. That's my biggest fear. And that the future of this field is that we are looking for extraterrestrial sources of water, yes, but if we don't fix the mentality of what we're doing here on Earth, we will have the exact same problem with the new sources of water that we find, even if we find them. I'm going to end it with one little quiz. One, true or false, your children will experience water scarcity if nothing changes. Raise your hand. Yes, but so will you and I. All of us will. And my favorite quote, in rivers, the water you touch is the last of what is past and the first of what is yet to come. Meaning, let's learn from the past mistakes and let's start over. <laughs>